Hello there, you are listening to Advancing Ideas, the Cultivators Community Podcast. Here we share real stories of real people making their ideas happen in big companies. My guest is Coltrane Stansbury, a strategic and operational executive with over a decade of experience leading DE and I initiatives across various organizational settings on a mission to create more inclusive, equitable, and diverse environments and learning solutions for organizations and the communities they serve, and who's recently been selected as a recipient of the 2024 Top 50 DE and I Professional Award presented by On Conferences. So, welcome, Coltrane. Thank you, Yuri. Thanks for having me. So happy to talk to you, especially after the small conversation we had before and how you told me about the importance of having these human connections and having this conversation and sharing your knowledge. So tell me, tell me one thing about you that I can't find on your LinkedIn profile. Oh, wow. So I guess the one thing to find uh, is... Um, some people might be curious and might know, but I'm named after John Coltrane, a famous jazz musician, wow. maybe one of the fa more, more famous saxophonists. Um, and so uh, I always felt like it was a heavy burden to bear when I was a kid. My father and mother always had jazz live in the house, always told me and taught me and my sister have one other sibling about the importance of music uh, and art in culture and how it can inspire and how John Coltrane in particular inspired people through his music and saw the type of spirituality and leading people towards a type of joy and a type of unity in society through his music. And so I came out of my childhood, emerged with this idea that the music I make, whether it be literal or figurative music, the work that I would do in my life, that I would approach it like John Coltrane to somehow create and resonate with people, a type of contribution that would bring people together. And so do I'm, you I'm, I'm too. I'm also a Coltrane. <laughs> and do you create a uh, literal music? Like, do you play any instruments? I don't, the, the E flat alto saxophone was too big to lug home from school every day. So <laughs> I, I found that contributing through my, through the work that I do and the passion that I have and the connections is, is my, is my music. So let's switch a little bit to the work that you do. So what was the first time that you felt you've influenced somebody's professional or personal life? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so, wow. Uh, I'll go back to third grade and um, there was a bully in school. And um, in, in, in schools back then, um, students that had any kind of special need, emotional or physical, we were all in general population together in public school. I grew up in Trenton, New Jersey, urban public school system uh, in America. Um, un, you know, not unlike any other urban school district, uh, we were all jumbled together. And so before anyone could even separate out uh, a, a child who had any problems or could cause problems, we had to all experience each other's trauma. And so we were thrown into this classroom environment in third grade with this bully. Wow. And, uh, and I was a unifier back then. I wanted people to get along, get it right, and figure it out. I was the kid who wanted folks to uh, socialize around uh, at recess uh, together and, and cooperate and do things. And there was this bully always in the way, terrorizing people. And I remember uh, one day I stood up to this bully in front of everybody. And I didn't know whether or not anybody would back me or not, Yuri, honestly. I didn't even know. But I gotten fed up with us socializing with fear around this bully. And so I said to him this phrase, I didn't know what I was going to say, but it just came out from my gut. And I said, I'm going to mix you up and make you into something. <laughs> and everybody froze on the, on the blacktop, on the playground. They didn't understand those words. And I barely understood those words. I said, I want to mix you up and I'm going to make you into something. And years later, what I realized that shocked him and everybody sort of normalized into this place where as weird as that statement was, he'd never bothered us again on the playground. Hmm. Realize what I was saying to him. What I was saying is, it is better if you let us work together than if you fight against me. And if we work together, then the thing that I have, this unity that I have, it'll make you into something. 
if you let it get resident in you, then it can become something that can change your life. That's when I knew I could change lives. I knew that if you let me, if we let each other, we can mix each other up and make ourselves into something. And that that's what leadership is really about. It's not just about standing up against the bully. It's making the bully one of us. Mm. It's changing people's lives, changing people's hearts, changing people's momentum towards going towards something that's light, something beautiful, and something powerful and meaningful. And you know, I feel like you've had a little bit of happy ending because uh, it's not always like that. Sometimes bully are just going and like, uh, you know, getting shit out of people and uh, it, 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 you never know. But what do you think it's possible to still work together if bully doesn't want to cooperate? Uh, it's very difficult. If you fast forward, Yuri, to the work that I do in DEI, uh, inclusion, belonging, whatever we want to call it in its iterations, Uh, there are a lot of bullies on the job. There are people that uh, have power and there are power structures, there's stratification within organizations, there's pecking orders, there's politics within companies and organizations. And when we talk about equity, when we talk about carving out spaces and re-engineering processes and systems and office spaces uh, to allow for people to show up as their best selves and their greatest contribution, that can become a threat to people in power. And to diffuse that power and to give some of it up to allow others to have agency and space isn't easy for folks with privilege and people who've had a seat at the table by themselves. And so the work that I do is really about creating the awareness about people's privilege and not just creating the awareness, but also convincing them of the possibilities of working together, of mixing this office space up and making it into something right? What the possibilities are. And that shows up specifically in training sometimes. It shows up in coaching sometimes, Yuri. Uh, and it often shows up in um, creating processes uh, that allow people specifically to be empowered to have their own conversations. In other words, I'm not always yeah. rescuing people from the bully. It's arming people to have diffused conversations and how to problem solve in their own uh, teams. And I feel like it's work in progress, you know, it's, there is no ending point. It's like you are always keep doing it, but I feel like you still can break it into some projects. So I'm curious, what is the most impactful project you worked on or maybe still working on in the DI space that you are really love and you saw the most impact out of it? Well, I love this intersection between uh, DEI work and learning and development, right? I'm currently in a doctor of education program I just went, I geeked out on this last experience I had uh, at my former company, uh, building with the learning and development team, uh, DEI initiatives, um, uh, specifically two part uh, learning, learning and development initiatives. First part are building out modules, right? Just, just training uh, online that, you know, as we move toward a more remote and a more virtual workspace, building out a, we said, let's build a rocket ship. Let's build a, a module around allyship that allows people to learn and engage on the terminology, the definitions and level set on why allyship is important. And let's do that in a way that people can learn in an audio visual immersed environment. So, so we did that we were like, wow, check. But then we wanted to marry that with a discussion group. So I challenge the, everyone in the company and our leadership to allow me to do 90 minute discussions with everyone in the company. So after you finish the module, Yuri, you got to sit down with Coltrane and you got to, whether you do it in 10 people groups or hundred people groups, we've got to have a conversation for 90 minutes about what we're learning around allyship. And we've got to be able to Q and A each other, ask difficult questions, have hard, courageous conversations, go through scenarios together, And know that, to your point earlier, this is an ongoing journey. But to really set people on their path, launch the rocket ship in a way where three things are important. Number one, you're not alone. You've got colleagues on this journey with you. Number two, you've got um, information to refer back to if you get lost. And number three, the company is better off for your contribution once you engage and connect. But how to engage those people? Like, it all sounds very amazing. I totally understand what you're talking about. But how to make people 
really contribute their time and really invest their time into into this space yeah you, you can't make it too mandatory uh you know people will yield at a stop sign and they'll go through a yield sign people have this tendency to uh not slow down from what they've been doing what they've been, been doing so 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 um Making things mandatory is like a stop sign, and and people are very are very reluctant to stop what they're doing, uh, to turn toward what you, what what you want, and so in some way you've got to convince people through that a volunteer experience that there's a buy-in to this work, and that the volunteer experience, uh, if they show up voluntarily, it could yield a real result. Being really upfront about the impact and the importance of the work, and it's not always going to be a personal buy-in. Uh, I can't sell someone on that allyship is going to get you a raise, okay? But what I can sell a person on is that allyship is going to make your team better, and it's going to help you all perform more efficient, more efficiently. You're going to understand each other and communicate well. You're going to build trust that's going to show up in the work product that you produce. And so that buy-in in a volunteer environment allows people to slow lear, right? It doesn't. I, they don't. They won't show up in droves. This is not folks buying the, the 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 latest game at GameStop and showing up overnight in tents to wait for the next morning for the store to open. <laughs> But it does mean over time people will show up, and the people who showed up first will tag other people in. They'll say this crazy idea that Culturing has around allyship it works. I like it, and I think you'll like it too. And then to be able to create a buzz utilizing um, the online community the internet, Slack channels, and tying people in to be able to talk and have conversations about what they're learning is really, really important. You know, I feel like when you're telling people that you can more work more productively and effectively together and get more results, it's it's literally how you say it to people, that's how you get, can get a raise, you know? Like... That's right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's, it makes it a little bit easier. and. I'm curious what was or maybe is the main challenge that you face while working on the learning develop learning and development um yeah. pro project. Yeah, the hardest thing is that everyone is learning as they're building it. So the team that I'm working with, the DI team and the LND team, we are all learning uh the concepts that we're sharing. We're learning. So you know, ally it's not um We're not the experts, right? This is not calculus or, right? Um, and, and so therefore it's not just resident in our knowledge. It's really, it's res part of this is resident in um, our lived experiences, which are hard to mine for. Uh, there are times during the training where I laugh with folks and that I cry with them, that I, that I think I'm gonna bring up an experience to validate a concept and that I can do it in a way that's very uh, didactic. Uh, and then I wind up being emotional and realizing there's a part of it that um, I was unsure about until I verbalized it and shared it. And that's very organic. People can appreciate that. Uh, I'm warned against it a lot in the work that I do, but it worked in the bully setting in third grade and I just continue to do it. And that's confront the fact that we're better together than we're ever apart and that sharing vulnerably and transparently works. Um, executives and leaders don't like to share a lot of their personal life and experiences. And that's often to the detriment of making real human connections. And I get it, we've got careers to protect. We're part of a lumped middle class that's trying to protect our agency and what we've earned. And so a lot of times we'll lead with the brand before we ever lead with our humanity, but you can't do that in the DI space for long. You will be found out to be an information sharer and not yeah. really a leader. You just phrased something that I had in my mind. Like I was thinking like, it feels so much better to really work together and help each other, but still, There are that many people who are kind of like fighting with others instead of working together with each other. And now, now I understand why do they do this. So they are they are getting protective. They're heading, okay, getting defensive. You are learning through your journey, and you are definitely making mistakes. Yes. How do you feel about mistakes? 
wow, they're so important. Um, they're very important. They're not just important for your personal career journey. Uh, mistakes are important. Uh, they add to our wisdom of what we can share with people in real time and in later. Uh, and without those mistakes, we won't build uh, a catalog of wisdom um, that really adds and enriches our ability to share. Um, I made one of the biggest mistakes early in my DEI journey. Uh, I was working at a really big uh, healthcare company, large global healthcare company. I had a mentor, uh, the chief diversity officer at the time. Um, he's still a mentor and friend of mine today. And Anthony retired 18 months after bringing me in, but not before he gave me this program to develop and cultivate called the Gateway to Healthy Communities Initiative, where I was charged by Anthony's vision to create a program in urban America in classrooms, middle school and elementary school, some of the hardest classrooms in the country to uh, um, teach health literacy and get kids moving and exercising. And uh, that program was taking off and getting momentum. And then Anthony retires on me. And I'm like, whoa, my cover is gone, <laughs> right? And, um, but I kept going, Yuri, and it emboldened me and it charged me to keep moving and to create momentum. And I created a lot of momentum. I made a lot of connections. I made a lot of connections with community organizations and NGOs. I expanded the, 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 or, the uh, initiative globally and started impacting the lives of children in Africa and South Sudan in particular, and saving lives and empowering people. And the powers that be at the company, uh, what I didn't do is ask permission. And I didn't socialize the, what, the work that I was doing. And I got myself in trouble with the powers that be. And I got called on the carpet theory about pushing forward with this amazing program that was connecting with lives but then I didn't socialize, I didn't ask for permission, and I didn't get the buy-in. And I found myself having to backtrack and justify the work in a way that, that, that made me defensive and put my program on the ropes. And I learned a valuable lesson about socializing ideas, about getting buy-in, about understanding the internal politics, about good intentions are not enough, uh, and even goodwill is not enough. Uh, and how surviving and thriving are two different things. I didn't want to just survive. I needed to thrive if my program was going to be impactful. And that would require that I understood how to build relationships internally and how to really manage a stakeholder group. So you are talking about socializing and um, getting buy-in. So how do you approach it now? Yeah, so now I realize uh, that all this is about re relationships and relationship building. Um, and I, um, relationship building has to come before you want something uh, and before you need something. Uh, relationship building should be a type of skill that's always on. Uh, and not just always on, but uh, all, always available at some levels to everyone. Uh, and it is something that I learned from Anthony. And that is always speak to everyone you never know the security guard, the doorman, the, the person who works in the cafeteria are as important a person to show respect, to honor, and to listen to. They have just as big a story as anyone. Uh, they have relevance um, to the organization as anyone. Um, and that you may need them later in life uh, and draw inspiration from them throughout life. And... Um, and so in that vein, in that, in that sort of, in, in, with that idea, I go into every conversation in every organization, respecting that I could hear or be connected to something that could impact me or something I could share later or, or use later in life. I think that's important. And, and to have a, a digital relationship with people, not an analog. Mm -hmm. I'm not always the expert at everything. But to have this digital conversation with people that allows for a transfer of information, knowledge, and, and wisdom. Those three things. But you know, to build strong relationships, you have to really invest a lot of time. And the more people you connect to, is, the more people you are talking to, the more time you have to spend, uh, let's say, invest. It's still investing. And how do you deal with it? How do you maintain those relationships? 
it's a lot it's a lot um it's a lot i i would say i think the best investment uh is to pick someone to mentor and share with pick someone to help um investing most of your time finding someone to help you um is not inspirational uh it can be exhausting to try to find uh your help but by helping others you become the help you need mm. you become the help you need and it's less like waiting at the window for someone to see you uh it's getting out there it's using the skills you have it's making mistakes and sharing your mistakes you become the leader that you always want to be or that you're trying to be or that you didn't know was there by giving and so i spent a lot of my time mentoring i had uh whether it's my own kids or mentoring um new people that are new in their career new new to an organization new within their profession um and it's not just fulfilling it's necessary to my own leadership it is so 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 that that would be kind of my strategy advice uh give the thing you need yuri yeah yeah i totally understand what you're talking about it's still hard to find an example for me personally how to you know how to use it yeah. so maybe you can you can give me for example if we have like someone someone who's working in a corporate organization and yeah. they want they listen to you tell them like be the help you need what is the yeah. first step for them to do how to approach this advice yeah yeah so so let's take let's take that time where anthony just left uh our company my mentor who brought me into the company and 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 left and retired on me so that summer um i'm doing my work i'm busy walking around the office like literally in the office cubicles and getting things done and um and it's monday morning and i see a young man sitting at the cubicle at uh one of the what was an empty cubicle on friday he's sitting there now on monday and so i turn the corner and i notice him out of the corner of my eye busy and moving and i back up i literally reverse myself and i look at him his back is to me sitting in the cubicle with his slumped over the 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 computer and i, I and i tap him on the shoulder and i ask him who he is what his name is does he want to go to lunch <laughs> And that started, that was 10 years ago. Uh, Roby has been with me for 10 years. He uh, he went from being an intern there, uh, um, uh, given an opportunity uh, at the company, uh, born and raised in the, in the Washington DC area, uh, had just finished uh, college, uh, uh, finishing college and now has this rare opportunity. And I remember what it was like being that intern and could not resist the opportunity to connect with this young man. 10 years later, he's uh, doing really great. He's a sales rep for that same company um, and doing well in life. Uh, he and I have middle of the night conversations. He calls me, sometimes I call him for advice. But uh, so being a mentor is about this digital relationship as I talked about earlier. Um, it is as simple as making yourself available to people and seeing the qualities in them that um, uh, that could be cultivated um, and knowing that you have something to share. I mean, not everything to share, but something to share. Um, not every person, though, uh, has turned out to be a Roby. Uh, I've done the same thing with some individuals and they've had I've had varying degrees of acceptance and 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 uh and connection uh i've had folks i've tried to mentor who've been from my same city who went to my same uh, uh private school as a scholarship kid uh who who um who were in the same demographic as me who are also black men and they don't want anything to do with me until they really needed something uh and so you never know who you'll connect with um and we should be open to creating community with people who don't necessarily look like us, who don't necessarily share everything in common with us demographically. Some of the greatest people who I've mentored or who have mentored me don't look like me and don't share the exact experiences. 
have never worked in companies of my size and don't necessarily have my dreams in life. But we connect on something very human and something very possible. And that's what drives us to have lunch periodically and share ideas. I feel like you have so many learnings, but if you had started working in the DEI space now, what is one thing you would have done differently? Oh, wow. If I started today, um, I, I would have understood how deep, uh, how pervasive racism and sexism is in the office place. I would have, mm. I would have, I would have tried to understand that a little better. Uh, I approach the work as from a, as a optimist and, um, uh, and that programmatically, with good research and good data, we could solve any problem. And I didn't realize how pervasive the isms really are in the workplace and how much protectivism as a type of philosophical approach to commerce and business, the ability to protect the money, the stakeholders, and the processes that we currently have in place how pervasive protectivism really is in the workspace and how very difficult and challenging it is to create behavior change that leads to equity. It's a very, very difficult prospect um, because of protectivism. And I would have told my, I would, I would say to myself now, if I started, <laughs> if this were Coltrane, ad, I think I started in DEI, came from social policy somewhere around age 30, 35. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I would say to Coltrane, um, pick and choose your battles. You're not going to win all of them. Uh, and you don't always win for being right. Pick and choose your battles. Build allies in this work at the highest levels, but never fear what it's like to really build out the middle management and to be of a value to them. These are the people who are gonna be using the product of equity more than anyone. They're gonna be hiring folks and managing the people experience and doing timesheet approvals and vacation approvals and trying to help people get promoted and moving products and services and build the middle management's capacity and learn how to add value and make yourself indispensable in the work make yourself indispensable. And that doesn't mean pander to the bureaucracy, but it does mean have something to offer that makes it very hard for folks to dismiss you early so that your work can somehow germinate and grow. Got it. You know, Coltrane, I wish to have the sky as a limit, but time is a limit. So yes. the final question, name yes. one book or podcast or person from whom you learned the most. Oh, wow. Uh, Paulo Ferrer, um, who is a um, postmodern um, uh, researcher around social um, social policy and educational policy, wrote a book called "The Pedagogy of the Oppressed." Uh, he, in the vein of uh, Franz Fanon, who who wrote uh, "The Wretched of the Earth" about colonialism and the psychology of um, being socialized around. Um, you t um, um, authoritarianism and um, Paulo Ferrer's book Pedagogy of, Pre of the Oppressed ex it, it explores this concept and this idea that education by virtue of dialogue this this um, this very um, dialectic process of sharing perspective uh, and and information and wisdom education by virtue of that is liberation and it is revolution um and that um when done right when it's not indoctrination uh when it's not acculturation when it's not us used for assimilation education is really liberating it is our ability to really unify ourselves as a humanity as a global citizenship to affect and empower the world and one day we will actualize what that dream really will be to really use it for peace and to grow our society into something beautiful 
Um, but um, that book is really powerful. I would say Mahatma Gandhi, Bishop Desmond Tutu, Martin Luther King, um, um, Jane Goodall, and Mother Teresa are my great influences. Uh, and I would also say um, that my mother and my father are too, because they always had these ideas that I've talked about around our dinner table and always challenged my sister and I to be public servants, to be servant leaders, and to be people and citizens of goodwill. Yeah, and I always approach these conversations not as a final, like, okay, it's, it's a piece of content, it's like a podcast episode, whatever, but as a starting point to the conversation. So what is the best way to connect with you? The best way is through LinkedIn. Please reach out to me. Uh, I try not to ignore anyone. I'm open to all great conversations uh, in any way I can help. Um, so please reach out to me by, by LinkedIn. Uh, my profile is easy to find. Coltrane. There are not a lot of Coltrane's out there. Coltrane stands very Train, thank you so much for openly sharing your cultivator's journey and such valuable experience for all the change makers in the world who want to make a difference. Thank you, thank you Yuri. I appreciate the time. And yeah, hope to see you in the cultivators community.